Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to another community conversation. Today we're going to have a uh, conversation between uh, Paul Manley and Chris Brown, also known as Farmer Brown. And we're glad that you could all join us. Um, I'd like before we start to acknowledge that we are on the um, traditional unceded territory of the um, Snanamal First Nations and that the um, writing of Nanaimo Ladysmith also encompasses the traditional territories of the Snanawas First Nations, the Stuminis First Nations, and the Laaxan First Nations. I'd like to invite people to uh, ask questions in the YouTube uh, comment uh, area um, in this live stream. And of course, as always, stay friendly and polite, even if uh, someone says something that you disagree with. I'd also, before we start, like to remind everybody that next week, next Wednesday, we are going to have another community conversation, this time with uh, Chris Beaton of the Nanaimo Aboriginal Center and Joy Bramner of the Mid-Island Métis Nation. It's gonna be about an indigenous resilient response. We're gonna talk about the National Indigenous Peoples Day and lots of other things. And now I'd like to pass it over to Paul. Welcome, Paul Manley. All right, well, thank you, Alain. And uh, yes, we're, I'm here on Nanaimo territory and uh, Alain's perfectly correct. We, the, the riding I represent, Nanaimo Lady Smith, uh, covers Lax and Staminas, uh, Snanamo and Snanawas First Nations and, and their territory. And uh, we, we appreciate them uh, having us here as uninvited guests. So <clears throat> we're, we're talking about local food today. And this is something that's been near, near and dear to me for uh, a long time, as many people will know. Um, and it's, it's become very apparent during this pandemic uh, that that uh, we can't rely on global supply chains for things that we need. And uh, the immediate example right now is personal protective equipment. But food has already been flagged as an issue because we rely so much on imported food. Canada is a net exporter of food, but what we export is uh, grains and pulses and uh, beef and pork. And we import a lot of other things. And um, we, we have a globalized uh, economy. We live in a globalized world, but we're, we're also dealing with another crisis and that's the climate crisis. And one of the ways that we, we need to deal with that crisis uh, is by lowering the carbon footprint on our food. And that means that uh, we, we lower the food miles that we have <clears throat> for everything that we have on our plate. And that's really important. It's something we, we can do uh, each and every one of us by choosing uh, what it is that we, you know, what it is that we're going to eat and what it is that we put in our fridges and uh, what we do with our yard space if we have some or our balcony space if we have some. And um, Chris Brown, Farmer Brown, has been somebody that's worked in this area. As I've known him as a, as a passionate uh, advocate for local food. Uh, for a long time. <clears throat> of course, uh, one of the other things I was going to mention is that, that uh, you know, back in the day, 50 years ago, we produced the majority of food that we uh, consumed on the island. And it was, it was in the, uh, the range of around 70 or 90 percent. Now it's, it's in the range of three to five percent. We're very dependent on food coming from elsewhere. And we have one of the best growing climates in Canada, and there is no excuse for having to import food from elsewhere. Um, when my, my mother-in-law lived in, in the Yukon, she grew garlic up there. There's no need to import garlic anywhere in this country. So <clears throat> Chris uh, has been somebody I've worked with in, in uh, different situations with Nanaimo Food Share, uh, just on projects around uh, farm ship, around his own refarm projects, and uh, is a great advocate for local food. So welcome, Chris. Yeah, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, it's uh, it's it's exciting to have the opportunity to uh, share some of my observations and my experiences. And uh, you know, there are some challenges that we're facing right now, and I think 
uh, a lot of those challenges can be addressed by uh, through creating local food systems. So I'm excited to have this conversation. Right on. So <clears throat> we're going to start just looking at uh, some of the main identifying issues, things that need to be fixed and, and weaving in solutions. And, um, you know, I, I was mentioning the, in the con context of uh, COVID-19 that, that uh, we've seen how the world reacts with PPE and how, you know, we're very reliant on somebody somewhere else producing things for us. Mm -hmm. So those, those lessons, those long supply chains, how that pertains to food security. Even before this pandemic, we were talking about things like uh, the drought in California, weren't we? Yep. And and the writing's been on the wall for a while that we're very reliant on on other regions and other places. And uh, you know, we have a president in the United States right now who's a little bit mercurial and uh, makes decisions on the fly based on. Uh, <laughs> but what's going on with his Twitter account that day and, you know, closing the border or, or uh, uh, deciding that he wants to shut off, you know, put tariffs on, on uh, products or save a supply for himself is, uh, you know, for his own people is something that, that uh, we've kind of been ma made very aware of. Mm -hmm. um, so, Maybe you could talk a little bit about some of these other issues, Chris. Yeah, sure. So I, um, I actually got into agriculture from studying anthropology. And the story went that societies fail or succeed uh, based on how they manage their farmland. And so I, uh, that was a pretty big light bulb moment for me. And that's when I was first learning about um, the challenges of climate change and um, kind of the plight of the future ahead of us. And uh, what I came to understand was um, one of the things I could do to help my community and my family and, and nature was, uh, was grow food. And um, it, it, it's been quite a learning experience. Uh, I really, I, I wanna start by thanking all the mentors that I've had along the way, my teachers and, uh, my, and some of the experienced older farmers that I've worked with. Um, there, there's this ancient, there's this ancient tradition that we're all part of here um, in a globalized world, and that's agriculture. Um, we all eat. It's the one thing we. It's one of things we have in common, and I think it's a really important starting point uh, in looking at the challenges we're facing. So yeah, there's a there's this COVID crisis right now. And it's, it's highlighted uh, some of the, the fragilities of our system. And I think what we want to do in this conversation is talk about um, how we can look at some of those, for those, those weak points and uh, address, address some of the problems. So you were mentioning personal protective equipment uh, as kind of like an eye opener. You know, we, we live here in this riding in, in Nanaimo Ladysmith. Um, you know, we're on an island and we're importing the, the majority of our food. And if the ferries stop, then we're, we're in an increased crisis. So, you know, what does food production on Vancouver Island look like? And uh, how, how can we use, you know, how can we, how can local agriculture address climate change? Yeah. Yeah. So, so one, of those thing, one of those things is just the age of the farmers here. So there's a, well, in, in Canada in general, as the, the um, average age of a farmer is, is 55 um, and transitioning farming and trans transitioning that knowledge, there's been a, this kind of misconception that people aren't interested in farming at all. And um, I've just found that that's not true just by, mm -hmm. by meeting people like you. And I, I, we actually met when you were an anthropology student at VIU before you got into the whole farming uh, farming thing. But for me, I started digging up my lawns uh, decades ago. Uh, I learned to garden from my, from my grandmother. Um, and, you know, I, I think uh, since my mid twenties, probably I started, I started gardening uh, 
in the houses that I had and digging up lawns and, and uh, growing perma permaculture and uh, uh, just trying to, based, based on environmental reasons, but also knowing where your food comes from. And I actually just really enjoy growing food. Um, but I can't grow enough to feed everybody. Mm. So we need farmers and we need to reclaim the land that we have on the island. And uh, one of the things I've heard you say over and over again is that the number one crop on Vancouver Island is hay. Yeah, and to me, you know, all these challenges now present opportunities. So those hay fields can be transitioned into food growing spaces. And I use the word transition because we need to look at this in a long term process. It takes a while for for farmers to cultivate um, arable land. And if you're installing an orchard, you're not getting a harvest for, you know, going eight years or so. And um, so this is a long term thing. We're thinking long term. And, you know, we want to, you know, you mentioned the farming age of, of the average Canadian farmer is close to retirement. How do we transition that knowledge from those farmers onwards? And, you know, I think we really need to be talking about climate change as part of our regular conversations. And, um, and, and further, the way that global food is grown right now in a, a for-profit uh, at all costs uh, approach is, is making, the, making things worse. So the, the clearing of the rainforests and the tilling of the soil and the monocultures and the environmental and social in, injustice issues I think this is something that we need to address and, and can be addressed with local agriculture. Yeah, the pesticides, the insecticides, the uh, fertilizer coming from fossil fuels. Um, and one of the, the, you know, in tandem with the climate crisis is the bio, crash in biodiversity. And so one of the things I've heard you talk about a lot is uh, regenerative farming. So can you explain that a little bit to the folks out there, what that, what that term means and how that that works towards um, improving our, our lives and, and improving our, our chances with climate change. Yeah, so there's a lot of talk about sustainability and um, sustainability means sustaining, continuing, and a lot of destruction has occurred to nature. And so the idea of regenerative agriculture is we're actively healing the land. And um, th that's doing polycultures, which means many. So we're growing a diversity of crops and we're turning these farms into ecosystems, growing both perennials, which are long-lived plants, uh, biannuals, two, two years, and annuals, which are one season. And thinking about a farm as an ecosystem and creating biodiversity and niches for all the soil health and the insects and the animals uh, in that ecosystem. So uh, regenerative, these regenerative agricultural practices, and there's quite a lot of information coming out on it right now, is, has been identified as one of the best solutions to us adapting to the challenges of climate change. Mm -hmm. So one of the other, one of the ish, other issues around uh, food and his control of seeds. And so we've seen uh, companies like Monsanto and, um, uh, big seed companies trying to, well, you know, create seeds with uh, uh, using genetically uh, modification techniques so that they can patent seeds. And then more and more of the seeds that we we pick up at the, you know, at the hardware store or uh, the garden center, those are patented seeds now, right? They're um, we're we're seeing corporations, multinationals, patenting life forms. And um, seed collections become a really important thing as well, right? Yeah, and so you have to think seeds are alive and they're constantly changing as we plant them to adapt to the changing climate. And seeds are also part of our shared history. I think the story of us as hunter-gatherers and then becoming agriculturalists through saving seed was really what kind of did it for me. It was just a fascinating story. And so um we've kind of lost control because some of the larger companies are trying to control seeds uh, for a for-profit um, incentives and so we you know i think 
are needing to look at local small scale solutions and, and be less dependent on kind of the big guys to, for offering seeds. So um, there's, there's some pretty cool initiatives uh, with local, with, with breeding and saving seed in our communities. Yeah, food shares uh, doing that with, um, they're connected with, uh, with a- um, BC Eco Seeds Co-op. Right, so they're, and, and they're creating seeds that fit into the, the ecosystem here. So after a number of cycles through those seeds adapt to the, to the microclimate that we have here and thrive. Mm -hmm. um, corn is one of those examples of a, of a, a crop that's been, uh, you know, where it's selected and selected and selected and prior to, prioritized for uniformity, long shelf life, transport, transportation, all those kind of things. And we end up, there's like multiple different kinds of corn uh, or bananas. There's really one sort of monoculture of bananas now, right? And mm -hmm. I think the same thing has happened to wheat and so, to some of the other um, crops that we have. So yeah. we lose varieties, right? Yeah, there's seed biodiversity loss. So we're prioritizing a small select set of seeds that do these things for us for maximum production. But we're now seeing that there's so many, lots of problems that are arising from it. And, you know, there's, there were thousands of types of corn that were grown by uh, indigenous Mexican people and people throughout, um, throughout the Americas, but um, it's, it's become commercialized. So, you know, as part of reconciliation, even um, encouraging seed saving is, is a really powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and of course, food, food is all about sovereignty as well. So the idea that we can produce our own food as a community, as a region, as a nation is important, but personally as well, it's about our personal sovereignty and nutrition is so important and so key to our health. And the more processed um, food that we consume, the unhealthier we seem to get. Um, and that that's, uh, you know, a, uh, a key issue around uh, things like diabetes, obesity, uh, cancer, heart disease, all of those things where we're, you know, the, the interior of a, your average grocery store is filled with processed foods that are full of chemicals and, um, you know, grown in conditions that aren't, that where there, there's no microbes in, in the soil. It's all, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Unliving. artificial fertilizers and pesticides and insecticides and everything else and so we've drifted so far away from what natural food is really about <clears throat> and it's it's um it's problematic so we have some bottlenecks to solve and and you've you've highlighted a few of these one is uh distribution and access do you want to just talk a little bit about that chris yeah, so I've been farming here in Nanaimo for the past nine years, and uh, I've made some observations. And, you know, I'm really interested in how do we scale up the local food movement in such a way that it, it's, it's feeding the majority of the people on the island, because it just makes perfect sense. We live on an island, we're importing most of our food, everybody eats. Um, <laughs> Why, why aren't we growing it ourselves? It, it, it's kind of like, oh, okay, this seems really obvious. You know, we can grow apples here and yet we're importing apples from New Zealand and Chile and with like a big carbon footprint. So, you know, I'm, I, I've studied this, I've experienced it. And now it's like, okay, let's focus on solutions. Let's take actions now based on all these needs. So there's, there's some, a, key, a few key needs right now. Uh, one of them is distribution and access to food. So right now, um, local farmers are competing against the grocery stores, um, which are kind of a 24 seven availability of food. And so um, what we kind of need is, uh, is an organization or entrepreneurs who can sell on behalf of the farmers so that they can focus on growing. Um, and really we need to think about scaling up because um, in Nanaimo, if the, the demand for local food increased by uh, even just a small amount, one, one to 2%, local farmers wouldn't be able to meet that demand. So we need to systematically think about, okay, over several years, how do we scale it up? And one of the ways is by getting um, 
ha having hubs, food hubs that can sell on behalf of the farmers and also take on contracts for farmers to sell to places like hospitals and care facilities and other institutions. So distribution and access is a, is a bottleneck that needs to be addressed. Yeah, there's, we have um, an initiative by the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance for the Island Good program, where you can see the label on, on different products in the store that are produced on Vancouver Island, which is a great initiative. Um, and those are, I guess, larger producers that are able to get stuff into the grocery stores. We, we have a lot of small scale farmers and I th there was an effort in, uh, you know, a decade ago to create a um, the Heritage Food Service Co-op to bring farmers together and then and then work on a distribution system and actually get food out into institutions, uh, get institutional buyers like universities and hospitals and to support the local food uh, movement. And one of the one of the issues that they, you know, that uh, large organizations like that encounter is if one if they're just making a deal with one farmer and they want carrots and so many carrots and then the farmer runs out of carrots then they have to go and find another supplier but if a bunch of farmers pull together and they have a hub uh, and a way to to process and distribute and get food out there that that's that's key to building a local food system um, and the next thing you got on here is um, uh, lack of professional farming and, and gardening expertise. Yeah, so, you know, farming is a trade and a profession and a skill and a lifestyle. And, you know, it's, I, I think this could be one of the biggest bottlenecks right now is who, who will train the farmers? How do we get this knowledge out there? And, you know, one of the most amazing things that's happened through the COVID emergency is this phenomenon of people returning to their gardens. And, so many people want a garden now and they're realizing, hey, I've never really done this before. And so how do we get the knowledge out there to, and get people skilled up in their gardens? And, um, you know, one thing is, is definitely just doing it and trying it and, and engaging with the seasons. But I, you know, I'm really interested in, in societal level change. And so how do we train up teams of farmers who are able to take on these hay fields and grow significant quantities of food that are going to be able to feed uh, cities of people. Yeah, when, when you mention societal change, it brings to mind to that whole argument about people wanting, like, what does, you know, this locally grown cucumber or tomato is like 50 cents more than, than uh, the other one that I could get at the grocery store that just came in from California. Uh, and people need to, you know, stop that mentality. And I think that COVID is actually helping people think locally a lot more. Mm -hmm. So Alan, Alan wanted to bring in a few questions from the uh, comment thread. Yeah, there's been some uh, good questions in the comment thread. So um, Angie asked uh, groundwater licensing. I don't know if you guys know a lot about this. The, the minimum size of area that can be watered before paying yearly licensing fees is a quarter acre. Could this be increased to five acres to reduce entry barriers to small farms? Chris, are you familiar with this issue? Uh, I, I'm aware of it, but I'm not sure if I can speak too, too in depth of it. I think, okay. um, yeah, water, water is the issue and we live in dry times. So I think um, finding, finding ways to help uh, people water their land sustainably is, is important. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of methods also to you know swales and swaling and stuff like that to keep water on the land and to to make water flow through and leave the land at, at a slower pace and retain more of it, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, and, and water water falls under provincial jurisdiction, and we and we just had an updating of the uh, British Columbia Water Act. Um, there's still some issues with it. I mean, it's the Small farmers are treated the same way that uh, big corporations are treated, and um, that's kind of a problem. A problem. Um, although they, they, we see companies like Nestle being able to draw millions yeah. of liters of water for next to nothing, uh, but the licensing uh, part of it, it it's, it's important to make sure that, uh, that water is prioritized for, for growing food rather than you know 
um, all these other uses that can happen uh, that aren't necessary, you know, and especially yeah. in the drought drought times. And I think as far as regenerative agriculture goes, um, you know, we want to try to create water holding capacity in the land. And, and that's done by building the soil, uh, ensuring that the soil isn't tilled and exposed to the, to the air and to the sun, uh, and incre increasing um, having polycultures of perennials and annuals in, in a farm ecosystem. Yeah. Great. So relating, related questions to, to that more is, um, so farming as a small business also has more barriers to entry. If a person is trying to practice regenerative agriculture, it takes several years to work before profit is made. This means they don't qualify for small business tax breaks. Expense records can be saved for 20 years and back calculated, but this requires considerable capital during the farm building process. So this is kind of about like the business of, of, of trying to start a small regenerative farm. And I'm wondering if you have, what, what you have um, if you can say anything about that, Chris. Yeah, we do need to run farms like businesses. That's part of sustainability. And, you know, we should be able to earn a livelihood farming because again, everyone eats what we're growing is a higher quality product. Uh, and, and, and so there should be more demand for it. So this is where I think we farmers do need support from the government. I think it needs to be prioritized as a, a health initiative. Uh, the food that we're growing is preventative medicine. Um, instead of reactionary. Uh, and so what what does it look like to um, help rebuild the small scale local farm economy? Um, what do new progressive loans look like? Um, I heard about one where uh, farmers are offered loans and then they're allowed to repay them by donating that food to a food bank. So um, there are ways, but we, Farmers need help right now, and th this is an opportunity for a government to step in to help us. Yeah, Jake was telling me about a program in the States where farmers are actually contracted to grow food for food banks. And I think that that's a really good, that's a really good model to look at because we want to make sure that, that, that people that are low income and need uh, the services of a food bank are getting good nutritious food. Uh, the other, like the really good model here in the community is the good food box, uh, with uh, the Nanaimo Food Share, where they're growing food at five acres and now at the Westwood Farm and uh, producing a good food box, which goes to, to uh, people on low income. So seniors, students, people with uh, diverse abilities, uh, single parent families, you know, anybody that's in need that needs good nutritious food. And there's, there's a box of fruit and vegetables. And then having these gleaning programs around the community because people have fruit trees and then they just let the fruit hit the ground and rot. And uh, that happens a lot in, in, in our community. And that's something we, we should be capitalizing on more, um, growing food in, in green spaces in the city. And just if you, have, if you have those kind of food forests set up with gleaning programs, so you make sure that, this, that the food doesn't go to waste, then, then you're able to produce a lot more nutritious food for people on low incomes. Yeah, I and, really, oh, pardon me. And, and supporting farmers. I started off with that supporting farmers piece, you know, getting farmers started out um, with, with government programs that actually, you know, could put the food into the hospitals or put the food into care homes or put that food into our school system. So when, when money is being spent on food already for these programs, uh, by the government, why not support farmers locally to do it? Yeah, we, we need, uh, if farmers are able to have known sales avenues, then they're able to plan accordingly. And that's kind of like the CSA model where uh, people pre-purchase the food and then they receive X number of weeks of produce. So if, if there was kind of like a government level CSA where new farmers were, were hired to grow food for institutions like schools, hospitals, care facilities, you know, they may have a better chance of getting off the ground um, in those, those early hard years. Yeah, the farmer's market model, I mean, it's, it's great, but it's, uh, 
because you connect with your farmer at the market but if you know when you talk to farmers about it it's a lot of work getting all that stuff harvested and then into town you know and set up your booth and and sell and if you don't sell then and you've over harvested for the day then it's problematic right did you have another question Nilan? yeah so another question is an interesting one um what do we you said that a hay is the biggest um product is the biggest agricultural product on vancouver island so what what happens with all that hay and if we transition away from hay, is that going to cause a problem i i think it's grown for uh horses and for cattle and and um, other grazers and um i i think that uh, having hay is is important way for for some people to earn their farming farming livelihood. Um, I'm I don't want to attack it. I, I will challenge that it's it's it can be water intensive. Um, but uh, one of my friends who I'm working with, he's doing regenerative um, livestock grazing, in high intensity livestock grazing, and the moving the animals around on the field. Um, where they're they're eating it and pooping, giving the, the grass a chance to regrow, um, is uh, is a more productive model for for raising uh, meat animals, and, uh, and they're moving them on to the next spot. High intensity yeah. rotational grazing, and so I think like when I see a big hay field, I just think of it as as an opportunity. So I'm not saying like let's get rid of all the hay fields. I'm saying let's strategically use. Uh, these big open spaces and uh, transition them into more biodiverse uh, farm systems. Great. So I think that there's going to be more questions, but I think we should go back to sort of the plan and then we can go back to questions from the audience in a little bit. I think the next spot that where you guys were at was about access to land, housing and farm infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, a lot of young people want to get into farming and it, it's a struggle to, to, to get onto farmland. And um, I think part of the vision of permaculture is where you see problems, can you turn that into an opportunity? And so if there is an aging farming population who would like to stay on their land to continue farming it, what would it look like to pair a new farmer with some of the older generation of farmers? And um, you know, something we were talking about earlier was um, uh, in crown on crown land, um, they're leasing crown land to grow trees. Is it a possibility to lease crown land for agricultural purposes? How can we think outside the box to make land available to, to new farmers so that their land secure and they don't have to move? Yeah, and one of the other issues is just the, the um, passing of uh, farms down through generations and the amount of taxes uh, that are involved in doing that. And so I've saw, signed on to a private member's bill that will um, make it more affordable for the next generation to take over a farm without without having a big tax bill to do that. Um, yeah, so then the next thing we have here is a culture to support local cuisine. And I know... Uh, you know, we have some great restaurants in town that, that um, they take regular delivery of produce from local farms. Um, you want to talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, it's interesting trying to define what um, the Canadian food is, like what's the Canadian cuisine. And, and for me, it's just like what, what's eating in season look like? And that's how I identify as my cuisine. And as you mentioned earlier, Canada is the largest grower of pulses in the world. So like, why aren't we eating and celebrating chickpeas more, for example? Um, and, you know, part of this is, is addressing like, how do we support people in, a, in valuing what we can grow here in our climate and not saying, okay, this, this recipe calls for mangoes. So I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go to the store and buy mangoes. Well, what's in season? How, how can we use that as a starting point? Yeah, well, that's the, the other thing too, is that there, that's why we have New Zealand apples right now. Yeah. And it, it's interesting. I was at one of these, one of these forums, these local food forums and a guy got up and he was super upset about why he couldn't buy a local tomato in January. And I was like, that's an expensive tomato because you're doing that in a greenhouse that you have to heat and light. 
And so, you know, we don't need tomatoes all year round unless you want canned tomatoes, which is what, what uh, my grandmother used to do is grow a lot of food and can it. And uh, I learned to can when I was a kid as well. And, and uh, it's something I enjoyed doing, you know, for a number of years. I haven't, I haven't done it. Uh, I just haven't had time to deal with that. But um, preserving and processing locally is super important. It, uh, Maine Island used to be um, a major tomato hub. You know, they used to grow a lot of tomatoes there and can tomatoes and, and ship them all over the place um, just because it was a good environment for growing tomatoes. So we need to think about food in that way, low, you know, uh, eating seasonally, but also preserving what we have when we have abundance. Mm. And also, you know, they, the way that... Um, a lot of traditional diets work there is very good for your body you know so if you're in a if you're in a season where you're eating a lot of berries and fruit it's actually cleansing for you you know and in the winter time you're dealing you're eating a lot more proteins and heavy foods which are you know uh and and grains and things like that that are slow burning and give you the energy um over a longer period when you're when you're dealing with the cold and in the summertime, you know, just eating eating your uh, your fresh veg and your fresh fruit, super good for your digestive system. Yeah, we're we're a little bit disconnected from eating seasonally because we are in such a globalized world. And totally disconnected from it. It's kind of created this this problem where there's demand for out of season things, and and uh, we kind of feel entitled to, to to it because we can get them from the grocery store. And that's, that may be a reality, very likely is going to be a reality that's going to shift as we deal with climate change, where we can't afford to keep importing these things. So I'm, I, that's something that I'm, one of the first lessons I'm teaching to my students is what's in season, what are the seasons and how do we engage with them and how do we celebrate them? Mm -hmm. and yeah, then, I, st I still have a squash that you grew for me last year. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of squash. Yeah, you know, they last all year, all year long. So that's an example of something that that you can uh, store and and have later on in the, the dark winter months or in the spring or the early summer when the squash aren't out yet. Mm -hmm. I'll get that one done soon. So those are kind of some of the main challenges we've identified. And it's funny, I've got like five pages of solutions written down here. I'll, I'll try to post them on my website. But for, for me, one of the first set of solutions is, is education. And um, in, in the public school system, what does agricultural literacy look like? H how can we make this part of the public school curriculum? You know, everybody eats. And based on this alone, I think it's really important to consider this as a top priority. You know, youth should know how to grow food and care for soil. Mm -hmm. and cook food and what's good for them and that's the, again that's you know back to what the Island food share is doing with uh the school community gardens which is a great program teaching kids about about growing food um and i know you worked at one of those gardens for a while at barsby so yeah yeah and you know there's so much new information coming out and as far as nutrition goes studies show that youth who are more well nourished are more prepared to learn and so what I propose is imagine if our schools had food programs where they were partnered with local farms. Um, when I'm in the school, I, I see all the, the wrappers from the single use processed foods that are going into the garbage. Imagine if a school of 350 students, you know, they, everyone got like a bowl of soup and a, and a salad for lunch. That would eliminate a huge amount of waste and, and these students would be getting this nutritious food and they'd be connected to it. Um, it how do we make that happen? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, children will be more experimental about eating things that they've tried to grow themselves. So they're yeah, yeah. And you know, what, how how do we make uh, food literacy a, a value? You know, values based learning um, and ecocentrism. You know. Um, how do we teach children that they're part of nature and not separate from it where you know we're humans humans comes from the word hummus which is, means earth soil and 
that's our sacred relationship that we've kind of lost touch with. And I think we need to really return to that feeling that we are part of nature and not separate from it. Yeah. Um, under education, uh, uh, apprenticeships, um, how, how do we train new farmers and um, how do we support people who would like to learn these, these things? Um, where can they learn how to do it, how to, how to grow food? Yeah. Well, horticulture programs and yeah, just building on it more and more. There's been this kind of attitude that it's not, it's not something that Canadians want to do. And you hear this uh, kind of line when you talk about, um, you know, putting young people, giving young people jobs uh, in agriculture and it's, and you get this sort of line, well, young people don't want to do that kind of work. Well, a lot of them do. And mm -hmm. um, we still get, uh, you know, in the Okanagan, you get fruit pickers that come come from uh, Quebec. It's, it's kind of a tradition mm -hmm. that's been going on for decades, right? Um, so, so something we also talked about were, were how do we create roles for um, agricultural specialists who are able to support uh, education, um, able to support transitioning people's living spaces uh, in their yards into, into spaces. Like, what does it look like to set up victory gardens, more community gardens, more school gardens, and then thinking really big, community and school farms? You know, how, how, what does that look like? Yeah. One of the things I love about what's going on in Ladysmith right now is they're using their boulevard spaces and, and green spaces to grow food. And um, the staff, uh, you know, that, that are involved in the, you know, maintenance programs love it. I mean, I was talking to the mayor about it and he was saying that they've got, you know, they're, they're growing crops together like corn and beans and the, you know, the, uh, the, the bean plants are using the corn as uh, bean poles and, you know, there's food just growing in town that's available to people. And I think more and more, we need to look at those kind of things. Like that's what Cuba did. They had to do that mm -hmm. uh, to deal with the, the economic embargo from the United States. But it means that they use, a, they don't have to use all of those uh, fossil fuel inputs uh, and, for, for growing food. And that's an access thing you're talking about as well. People are, are able to see, um, see food in their community and be like, that's what food looks like. And uh, often it's in the countryside or, or the grocery store that we're seeing our food. And so I think it's really valuable just to see that as, as part of the community. Okay. We're gonna kick it over to Alan again, who's got some more questions from uh, folks who are watching. Yeah, so uh, really uh, timely because we actually have um, Zenny Martman is, is, is watching right now and she wanted to know um, what can municipalities do to support local farmers and, and buy <laughs> local more? So I, I, want, I wanted you guys to talk about that. And then there's a couple of other questions as well before we keep going. And just yeah. one thing to note that when we were talking earlier, because I do want to put a fine point on this, because it, it might not be under, um, maybe the people watching don't understand exactly what, um, what Chris was meaning when he said like uh, agricultural specialists. But imagine if, um, if there was like the city of Nanaimo along with like federal funding and maybe provincial funding, like a multi-layered government approach, actually funded in communities, agriculturalists who their like half their time could be booked by citizens in that city to come and advise the citizens on how to convert their lawns to food gardens. So imagine if like Chris spent half his time, you know, 20 hours a week, 25 hours a week. And, and you know, of those, let's say if it was 24 hours a week, people could book him for 12 people could book him for that week for two hour consultations. We would come once, kind of assess the property, then come again, do a, do a plan with them. And then sort of every week come to them for two hours and sort of help them transition their front yard. So, you know, think big, but... And let's talk more. I'll pass it over to you for more of what cities and, and municipalities can do. And then a couple of other questions. Well, okay. I think that example, like I was talking to, to Mayor Stone, Aaron Stone, um, 
from Ladysmith and what's going on in, in Ladysmith is a great example for Nanaimo. Let's use more of our space here to be, to be putting in fruit trees and nut trees and, and have gleaning pro programs to make sure that that food is actually uh, collected and then used for uh, the Salvation Army, the 710 Club, loaves and fishes, uh, for food hampers for people. And, and then you've got food growing around in the community, you know, the kids can just go and pick and uh, they walk by some raspberry bushes in the park and help themselves and walk by a plum tree and help themselves. Um, and or, or the greens that are growing. But I think that the, like the, the idea of supporting um, farmers for the agricultural space that we have in our community is really important. Um, but also, you know, uh, farmers that are using uh, urban lots. How many urban lots are you growing on, Chris? Uh, I have three in Harewood and three quarters of an acre on East Wellington. And I'm able to earn my livelihood uh, market, gardening in, market gardening in the city and, and doing garden consultations. Yeah, so that's, you know, a perfect example. There's a number of farmers that are doing that. And um, that's a perfect example of something that the city could could support and, and um, you know, work on ways to help young farmers access land like that. Um, you know, we could have programs where, you know, people do have uh, large, large lots that they would like to grow food on. And I know, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, seniors who've, who've grown their gardens for a long time, and then they just find that it's a lot of work, you know, to keep that, that amount of, um, you know, digging and land preparation uh, up in order to, to be able to grow food. And so um, maybe, you know, pairing people up in the community to utilize more of that space. Yeah, in response to Zenny's question, you know, Nanaimo is so beautiful. There's so much parkland here. And there are these teams of maintenance folk who go around and keep the parks beautiful. Imagine if some of their efforts were going towards maintaining food forest ecosystems and starting to create spaces within the city of city owned land that is for growing food that then is going to, to support people who need it the most. Um, there's, uh, there's talk about the East Wellington Park right now, which is uh, along the Millstone River in an agricultural corridor. And what does it look like to develop that site as um, a learning space, as a farm hub? And so in Richmond, they've got something called municipally supported agriculture, where the city is making available um, city owned farmland uh, in partnership with Kwantlen College for uh, young farmers to do their apprenticeships um, so they can lease a quarter acre or half acre or full acre for a number of years and, and study and, and do farming uh, on those spaces. The other thing that I think the city can really get behind and get behind quick is creating a year round covered farmers market at Bevan Park. So this is something that's been in the works for about eight years now. And Bevan Park is, uh, is old agricultural land where they had the, the ag fairs. And I, I think that as far as access goes, farmers have to go in the rain and sell their food. Imagine if, if there was a skookum building um, that farmers could sell at year round. And, you know, young people are wanting to go to cities that have food movements. So this would be a really valuable investment in community infrastructure. Well, that'd be a great investment in community infrastructure. And uh, okay. something to write a federal grant for green Let's infrastructure fund. Yeah. <laughs> write that grant, Zenny, I'll, <laughs> I'll back it up. I'll fight for it. Uh, a couple more questions from, uh, from the audience. Um, Paul, could the government change small business tax requirements for farms to be consistent with any other small business that are not required to make a profit to claim tax breaks? Hmm. Yeah, I think that that we could we could visit the um, the tax code and uh, think about these things. Like we have uh, entrepreneur programs, we have tech startup programs and we should be looking at food in in the same way and um you know having having it uh, tax incentive programs and giving the farmers the space to be able to 
to scale up because as Chris was saying, it takes a while to get to the point where you're, you're able to make the money that you need to, to make a real go of it. And I'll just uh, one more quick thing and then we'll go on because there's quite a bit more stuff to cover in, in the document here. But um, Kevin mentioned that there's a business in, um, there's a business called City Beet Farm in Vancouver that grows food in people's yards. They provide the expertise, the land over, owner provides the land and they get a cut. Which, that's basically spin, spin gardening. So I guess this is a business that does spin farming and we've known people who have done spin farming in Nanaimo and, and there's people who are doing it right now. So I guess this is some this is on a larger scale, but that's always we've already kind of covered that uh, talking about um, all the people giving the land. So we'll pass it back to the document, and uh, I'll mute myself again. Hmm. Yeah. So the, again, we I, I I wrote like a six page document on solutions. So it's like we're gonna try to get through it. We won't get through it, but. Um, <laughs> So the, the other header is um, um, health care for land reconciliation, people and climate change solutions. So, you know, if we think about food as medicine, you are what you eat eats and healthy to access to healthy food, you know, should be a public initiative. And this goes along the lines of preventative medicine. As Paul mentioned earlier, a lot of the food that we're eating is, is so bad for us. And, you know, if we were preventing disease in, opposed to reacting to it, I think this would be really important. Yeah. And uh, so I, I touched on this earlier, but this is an important one, which is regenerative farming mitigates climate change. So as plants grow and decompose, carbon from the atmosphere uh, becomes the soil. And farms can be ecosystems and bastions of biodiversity, which is hopefully helping to mitigate the sixth mass extinction. And as highlighted by the UN, small scale regenerative farming is our most effective response to adapting to climate change. Um, I really love the word agrihood. So I live in Harewood and Harewood was all farmland. So what does it look like to, to turn this back into an agrihood? And how can we create these, these small scale, highly productive food growing operations in urban and marginal lands? Um, I think it's a really good thing to address. Yeah. Dig up your lawn. Huh. <laughs> yeah, city beat farm. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about COVID as, as, as an important thing to consider in this. And I was listening to a podcast by one of my farming heroes, Joel Salatin. And, you know, studies show that if our gut has more biodiversity, people have stronger immune systems. And so this is going to become increasingly important as we disinfect public spaces. So we really need our youth to be exposed to healthy microbes that are found in garden spaces and farm fresh food. And the quote here that I use by Joel is, amazingly, we've become a culture that considers Twinkies, Cocoa Puffs and Mountain Dew safe, but raw milk and compost grown tomatoes unsafe. Yeah, well, it reminds me of um, my wife, Sam, going to the grocery store uh, earlier on in the pandemic and she was saying you know there's no toilet paper there was no Lysol wipes and the place where they kept the craft dinner was the the you know cupboard was bare they cleared off those shelves and the chef boy rd and the canned food but when you went the, the produce section was great there was still mm. lots of stuff there and if you went into the vitamin aisle where they had all of the immune boosters and the vitamins and everything else it was untouched right so people are are not really in touch with uh, what it is that might be good for them hmm. um, and really going for you know the heavy process stuff like where you need to bunker down and, and uh, make sure that your your food uh, survives a radioactive um, wave or something you know I mean we we had that kind of thinking in in uh, previous generations with uh, the threat of nuclear war hanging over our heads but you're absolutely right taking care of our immune system is super important and the and the first way to do that is by making sure that we have good nutritious food entering our bodies hmm. and gosh yeah are we done at eight o'clock we got five more minutes yeah oh man Play so through. The, so the other on. thing i i wanted to bring up was just the economic opportunities so everyone needs jobs everyone needs to earn a livelihood and have meaningful work and i think you know, if we're importing 
the vast majority of our food onto Vancouver Island, what does it look like to try to make up that deficiency uh, by growing food and re revitalizing the economic sector? So, you know, farming is, is, is an incredibly meaningful job. And, and when I went through school, it was never even talked about as a, as a job opportunity. And so that's something that I think we need to make part of popular culture, which is, you know, <laughs> when I say I'm a farmer, the first response is, that's a lot of work. And I say, <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy. I have a meaningful job that's full of relationship building and, and, and healthy, nutritious food. And this is what I choose to spend my time doing. And, um, you know, we need to celebrate hard work if, if you can. Um, and one you can get your grandkids doing it. You know, one of the, one of the, I used to bring teams of youth uh, that I was doing training for uh, uh, youth with multiple barriers to employment and people with diverse abilities. And I would take them to the five acre farm or take them to other farms for, to do a little bit of training. And they would work with Chris or they would work with uh, Craig Evans. And I was taking a van load of kids to uh, our youth to the, uh, to the five acre farm. And uh, one young fellow is like, I don't want to go to a farm. I don't want to work on a farm. I, can you, you got to find me a job doing something else. I don't want to go to a farm. Uh, and I was like, well, you just got to try this out for the day. We're going to learn how to do different things. And, and, you know, yeah, if you don't like it, absolutely. I'll find you a job doing something else. That's not a problem. And at the end of the day, he said, Paul, I really like that. Can you get me a job on a farm? Hmm. And I got him a job on a farm and he, you know, he enjoyed it all summer long. Um, because he was out, out in nature. He could see the care that he was giving to, to something that was, you know, growing and alive and producing food and uh, good tasty food, you know, like you can, you can graze a little bit while you're working sometimes mm. and, uh, and uh, it's perfect. Right. So. And, you know, if maybe I'll just bring up one more thing under the economy, which is, you know, it, there are some really amazing um, uh, grassroots initiatives that are happening in our communities. And I think they're, um, they're really good starting points. And I think that if they could be supported and scaled up um, then that's a really that's where like the top down meets the bottom up and yeah you know look what 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 does it look like to explore alternative business models such as cooperative private public partnerships uh, intergenerational collaborations land trusts indigenous led traditional land management enterprises uh, federally muni municipally supported agricultural initiatives canada has a lot of land and abundance comes from caring for the land. Yeah, we should have programs around every, you know, in every city and around every city to produce the food that the residents in that city need. We could do it pretty much anywhere. Yeah. Um, we might have to bust up some concrete in some places, but- well, uh, It's just practice, you know. Um, yeah. You know, we live here on the east side of Vancouver Island. It's been called the Mediterranean of Canada. It, we've got a year round growing climate and that doesn't necessarily mean tomatoes in the winter. It means planning for the crops that grow in this climate. And with a little bit of infrastructure and field development, um, you know, we, we can grow year round and we have a year round farmer's market uh, that's running three hours a week in Nanaimo. Uh, but let's, let's make that bigger. Yeah, for sure. So we have you've listed off a few different resources and initiatives. We've talked about Nanaimo Food Share, which has uh, got a lot of different programs that people can get in touch with. Uh, Lowe's and Fish's Food Bank, which is actually their food recovery warehouse, making sure that all of that stuff at grocery stores that you know goes close to its date doesn't uh, hit the um, the the dumpster, but actually goes to people in need and um, you know, I've been down there uh, volunteering in the past and done some video work down there. And, you know, a grocery store gets a bag of apples and one bad apple in it, and they decide mm -hmm. they want to pitch the whole thing. And all you need to do is open up that bag and put the one apple in for the pig feed and uh, the rest of it's uh, all good for humans. Um, there's the Island Roots uh, Farm Market, which is on, uh, on um, Wednesdays, 2 to 6 p.m. at uh, Bevan Park. There's a Cedar Farm farmer's market that's at the school again this year yeah Wu Bank school at and that's 10 10 to 2 on Sundays 
the Gabriola Farmers Market, uh, 10 to 2 at the Aggie Hall, uh, the downtown Nanaimo Saturday Farmers the Gabriola one. Saturday on Gabriola, yeah. Um, and then the downtown Nanaimo Farmers Market. Um, it opens up on June 20th. Yeah, and you know, for me, the thing is go meet your farmers, uh, get to the markets, have conversations and, and build those relationships and, and talk to them about how can I get a food box from you and do you need help on your farm? And, um, you know, it, it, it's an intimate thing, uh, eating. It, it becomes our bodies. And, and I think that we need to, you know, put a little bit more effort into, into that sacred relationship, which is eating food. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you said it. So um, th there, th one of the people who was viewing it said, like, it's OK, you can go long. And there's, there's so much. So it feels like we can do another one of these but uh, about food. But I do want to say a couple of things that one sort of quick question that maybe there's a quick answer to is, um, Chris, are you aware of a community accessible juice press or strainer filter centrifuge to save work? Because uh, somebody has a uh, a huge amount of, uh, produces a huge amount of grapes every year. I do remember I was once at food share and there was an apple, a community apple press there. Yeah, so they're called, um, there's one called Pressing Matters in Courtney and you can bring your apples there to be made into juice. I know that there's a private business uh, in Nanaimo called uh, Good Life Juice and you can hire them to make juice. But this is a thing and in, 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 this is an opportunity uh, entrepreneurs, are you listening? People want this stuff. Like, invest in a community juicer and let's make let's turn our surpluses into juice and value add it. This is what regenerate restoring local food economy looks like. Is how many opportunities are there um, to replace the imported things with things that we can produce ourselves? Yeah. Uh, okay. Another uh, a, a couple more that we could like do real quick. So th this isn't actually a, a, a question; it's a comment by Don. Uh, we need all food options: soil-based agriculture, aquaculture, hydroponics, aeroponics, forest farming, ocean farming, urban farming, etc. He read about a 29-acre farm in Cuba that was feeding 90,000 people. So, yeah. yeah to do all those things and um, Virat said that let, let's do everything possible to make our Nanaimo region Vancouver Island self-sustaining so that we don't really have to depend on the mainland or on foreign countries and I know big thumbs up to that. Um, I want to remind people again that next week there's going to be a conversation with uh, Chris Beaton from uh, Nanaimo Aboriginal Centre and with um, Joy Bremner from the Mid-Island Métis Nation about uh, indigenous um, resilience and response um, uh, to, and resistance and the, um, it's, there's the National Indigenous Peoples Day coming up. And um, I, I really, really want to thank uh, Chris uh, Brown, who's a dear friend of ours and, and an amazing human for joining us. And, um, and thank you, Paul, of course. And thank you to everybody who uh, joined uh, on YouTube. And thanks for all the, the good questions to the, to the people on YouTube. This, um, this uh, conversation is gonna be available on YouTube uh, once we're done. It's gonna be posted on, uh, on Paul's uh, website and it's also gonna be available on Paul's uh, YouTube channel. So you can uh, share this with your friends if you think anybody might be interested in this. And yeah, thanks so much again for joining us for another community conversation. Thank you, Alain, and thank you, Chris, for uh, joining us. Um, awesome, and and uh, tune in, tune in next week, and we'll we'll be talking about indigenous urban indigenous issues and how we celebrate uh, National Indigenous Days, uh, People's Day, and virtually. And in the meantime, everybody get gardening, buy local food, engage with your farmers. There's also, there's farm gate sales and lots of lots of farmers have farm gate sales. Get to know your farmers, as Chris says. And um, Chris does some farm gate sales too. Sometimes plants, Chris, weren't you just selling plants the other day? Or is it this weekend? When, when were you selling plants? Do some self-promotion, Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> come to the farmer's market. Uh, I'm at the Bevan Park. Uh, Island Roots Market, Wednesday, two to six. Um, if you want some plants, we can make a deal there. And um, it's all about relationship building. 
these are the people in your neighborhood, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks so much. Take care, Thank everybody. You. All right, take care. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.